The preservation of Gulf regime has become something that is not entirely related to oil. The services of Gulf regime are now far more than oil. In fact, you probably have seen uh, the clip from Channel 4 in England when uh, Ca David Cameron was interviewed about his relationship with Saudi Arabia. And when he defended that relationship, he didn't mention oil. He didn't mention the fact that they buy a lot of weapons, of course, which is a big factor. In last year alone, Saudi Arabia spent $80 billion worth of arms. I mean, certainly it's not to protect the Saudi people from, uh, from their government. Uh, uh, it is basically to be used by the United States or other powers, and mostly it's as an investment in America's war economy, in the American war industry, basically, the military-industrial complex. David Cameron, when he was defending the relationship, he said they provide us with intelligence. They provide us with intelligence, which is, which is quite an interesting cycle. We basically supply the Saudis with intelligence, and then we claim to our people, they claim to their people that, in fact, our relationship is based on intelligence they share with the United States. And in fact, if their intelligence is quite good, how come the most militant, fanatical Islamist movement that were created always had a very big Saudi control, and most importantly, Saudi, Saudi Arabia's government sponsored, spawned the rise of Al-Qaeda and its variants in the Middle East region. And there is a substantial element of Saudis who fund and who join the Islamist jihadi groups like Al-Qaeda as well as ISIS. But this is another pretext by a Western power for the relationship with one of the worst violators of human rights in the world today. Uh, the United States is basically, after the 1991, the end of the Cold War, wanted to create a new regional order. Basically, let's call it the expansion of the Camp David uh, order. The Camp David order, basically, was one which was based on countries that would sign peace treaties with Israel. The first one is Egypt. Lebanon was an attempt, but it didn't last. Here was the country that was said to be the second country to ever sign a peace treaty with Israel, and they tried the Falange right-wing militia, which ruled Lebanon under Israeli tutelage after 1982 for no more than two years. Uh, they tried to have a peace treaty with Israel, but Lebanon proved to be quite defiant in that regard. And the place that was known as the most accommodating of American-Israeli design has now become a symbol of resistance to Israel in the entire Arab world. Uh, and of course, it's fair to say is Lebanon will not uh, be the next or the one after next country to ever sign a peace treaty with Israel. There's a big substantial lobby against that in Lebanon today. So the United States wanted to expand the Camp David order beyond Saudi Arabia and Jordan to include Gulf countries. And towards that end, they worked after September 11 to produce that formula known as the Arab Peace Initiative, which takes me to the way American foreign policy developed after September 11. Uh, after September 11, basically the United States decided that the Camp David regional order should become a, encompass the entire Arab world. And this is something that will make it very clear why Syria, why Hamas, why Hezbollah, and why Iran were an obstacle, and why there was an attempt to eliminate them all. And the reason because they stood in that way. Think about it. If it wasn't for these powers, whatever you think of them, the United States would have imposed an entire closed monolithic region, politically speaking, that would follow America's and Israeli orders uh, throughout. But it hasn't happened. And this is why there was so many developments happened to change that. There was so much pressure on Lebanon. There were so many campaigns against Hezbollah. One day they used an Israeli war that basically uh, you know, collapsed because instead of a victory against Hezbollah, Israel suffered one of the worst humiliating defeats in the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict. A band, a band of volunteers, youngsters, in South Lebanon were able to teach a lesson to the Israeli military that was never taught to them by the massive forces of Arab armies. And I'm not saying that in any way to disregard the Arab soldiers per se, but the regimes themselves were never serious in fighting Israel. They were merely symbolically responding to Arab expectations, Arab public expectations for some role 
on behalf of the Palestinians, and there was a token intervention, but never was serious. But be that as it may, there was clearly a lesson that was taught that there is now uh, a new era in confrontation with Israel. The time when Arabs would flee from Israeli soldiers now belong to past history. Uh, the, the story of South Lebanon, where I come from, is now one where people in that region will tell you a story about the music to their ears when women and men heard the screams of fears from Israeli soldiers being chased by the band of young volunteers of South Lebanon. This changed the calculation. There was a war on Hezbollah. They used domestic allies, Saudi Arabia's client in Lebanon. And then, of course, there was, after September 11, the condition that Colin Powell read to a variety of regional order, we have these demands, and you are to follow them one by one. Lebanon did not, Syria did not, and Iran, of course, was not even approached. And that's when the wars began. The wars began. Uh, there was America's uh, war and invasion of Iraq, which destroyed Iraqi society. It ch I mean, I was telling my class the other day about how Iraq changed. Iraq went from being one of the most progress, I mean, it was a tyrannical regime. I mean, some people tell you like, but it was a tyrannical regime. And you tell them, and Iraq's neighbors are not. The other America's clients in the region are not. Saudi Arabia is a democracy, you know. It's like when America, they lament about lack of freedoms in Iran, and there is lack of freedoms in Iran. And yet, if you compare that to Saudi Arabia, certainly there is more of a tyranny in Saudi Arabia than there is in Iran. Uh, so the agenda, was, the agenda was to use America's military to scare and intimidate and to change regimes that were not towing the line. The plan that the neoconservative had in the White House of 2003 was very simple. They thought once they overthrow the regime, all Arabs would be dazzled by the great model of democracy in Iraq, and they will all want America's intervention in their life. But of course, the scenario did not go as planned. I mean, if I tell you some of these details, you wouldn't believe them. One of the details is, as some of you know, Ibrahim here teaches modern Iraqi history. I mean, uh, in Shiite uh, religious uh, doctrine, there is a notion of marja' taqlid, uh, object of emulation. This is a grand ayatollah who's emulated by a number of Shiites entirely voluntarily. And the grand ayatollah is somebody who rises among the masses, as they say in the language of these history books, like the reputation of a physician in a village. Nobody can elect that person. Those people emerge spontaneously on the basis of good services to the public. The same thing for these grand ayatollahs. These usually are modest people, incorruptible, because they control billions of dollars in some cases. And they have to be just and wise and scholarly and so on and so forth. But the United States, some of these Zionists in the White House, I mean, all of them are Zionists in the White House. Uh, so some of them said, what if we put a grand ayatollah of our own on them? You probably know the story, right? They went to London. They picked Abdel Majid al khui the son of a grand ayatollah, knowing that the son of a grand ayatollah does not become automatically a grand ayatollah. You have to attain that title on your own. They took Abdel Majid al khui in a military helicopter. They stopped, they stuffed his garb with cash, stacks of US dollars. They dropped him in the famous Imam Ali Mosque in Najaf. The rest of the story, of course, is a stuff of legend of the Middle East history for years to come. He was uh, immediately picked. I'm not sure about how many times he was stabbed, uh, but he was stabbed so many times that he died in a very short period of time, and the cash on him were found. And uh, so much for America's plan for the Shiite religious leadership of the country. Another scheme they had was that they were paying a group of Iraqi exiles, known as Iraqi National Congress, headed by Ahmed Chalabi. And they basically said that if we drop this guy, and he promised he will establish a secular democracy 
that will sign a peace treaty with Israel. And the Americans were very impressed, very impressed. Millions of dollars of our taxpayers' money were extended to Ahmed Shalabi. The CIA, according to the New York Times, warned the US government shortly before the invasion that an informal survey of Iraqis indicated that those who were asked about Ahmed Shalabi either felt nauseous or they never heard of the man. But you know how stubborn imperial powers are. They went ahead with their plan nevertheless they invaded the country and they thought people are going to flock behind the leadership of Ahmed Chalabi. I don't want to go over the history of what happened since I will just tell you the following. Ahmed Chalabi is so lacking in any popularity in the country that he is now attached, attached to, the, uh, to the amama, to the turban of a Shiite cleric known as Muqtada Sadr who fought against the Americans. And in the last election, he was able to secure a seat for himself by virtue of being a subordinate to the Shiite cleric Muqtada Sadr. And what about his alliance with the Americans? Well, he alternated. Now he is one of the chief allies of Iran inside Iraq. So America's plan didn't go well. And they thought, of course, Syria was going to fall. And Syria was going to just be too intimidated. But it didn't happen, if anything. The Syrian government was basically invited by, the, I mean, the American government all but told the Syrian government, once we're done with Iraq, we're going to invade you. So of course, they gave every reason to the Syrian regime to supply support for the various groups fighting the Americans inside Iraq, and that's what happened. Um, however, that was not the only factor that changed in the Arab political landscape after September 11. Because America never gave up on the Camp David regional order. And towards that end, they wanted to push all Arab governments. And to their eternal shame, they all went along, Syria and Lebanon, every one of them. And they endorsed uh, the Thomas Friedman peace plan, which is known as the Saudi peace plan, which is a, uh, I, mean, I mean, first of all, it was dead on arrival because the Israelis never went along with it. They basically called for a two-state solution, allowing Israel to be showered with love and affection by the Arab people, acceptance, as if these corrupt dictators and autocrats and potentates ever can speak and, uh, on behalf of the average Arab people. Uh, and they also didn't even speak about the right of return. If anything, the former Jordanian foreign minister, Marwan Maasher, bragged in his book, The Arab Center, uh, he placed himself in that center, uh, for some reason, the Arab right calls themselves center, perhaps to be more appealing to the American uh, Democratic Party. So he claimed that he was the one who fought any attempt to respect the right of return in the Arab peace plan. Uh, but the Arab peace plan has, be, has, ha, it has been obsolete. The Saudis keep begging the Israelis to follow it and to respect it, and the Israelis ignore them completely. But yet there is a big difference, which is there is now a regional alliance without peace treaties between Saudi Arabia and several Arab countries and the State of Israel. And they now engage in covert operations in conjunction with the Americans and in some cases on their own. To that extent now there is an independent subcontracting of America's military mission in the Middle East region. Uh, there is certainly cooperation between the Saudis and the Israelis on the war on Hezbollah throughout the region, on the war on Hamas, on the war on the Muslim Brotherhood, on the war in Yemen, on the war in Syria, and the list goes on. Because that now is a new era in which Saudi Arabia is no more the former hypocritical double-speak government, which used to pretend to work for the Palestinians in public, and behind the scenes it works totally with the Israelis. Now, it's become quite open. Prince Turki Al Faisal has met several times publicly now with Israeli officials. Last time was two weeks ago, in fact, with the leader of one Israeli parties. And uh, the Israeli leader who met with him, uh, Leped, said uh, before the meeting that I made it, I'm going to make it very clear to him that I will not accept a, uh, a right to return. I'm not going to expect Palestinian rights. And so he listed all the stuff that were in the Arab peace plan to make it very clear, I will sit with you and talk to you, but not on the according to the peace plan. 
This is a peace plan that American Zionists formulated after consultation with the Israelis, and yet it was not accepted uh, by the Israelis. 